Hello everyone, it's nice to be back with you in this next video, this next class. So today's video is uh, the class for May 18th, 19th and 20th, okay? So hopefully you guys have had no troubles with the previous lessons and let's get started. Today's activities, the first activity that we're going to do is we're going to check uh, the workbook pages 98 and 99 just to remind you uh, that was the homework that we assigned to you last class okay so make sure you before we check it with you you already have it finished then we're going to start working on our student book we're going to continue with unit 9 listen lesson a and today we're going to work on listening and grammar uh, exercises it's going to be student book pages 106 and 107 okay the next activity is we're going to go over uh, some uh, first for schools in the first for schools book we're going to do some FCE practice it's going to be practice test five reading part one remember we go over vocabulary and we also read um, the, the book the the reading about the vocabulary that we're doing okay and the last thing uh, is we're going to tell you your homework right now it's workbook page 101 okay so um guys let's get started with today's class i'm going to leave you off with teacher rafa to check activities on workbook page 98 and 99 so let's get started now with teacher rafa hello people let's get to work so number one review read the email complete the sentences with these words hi nicole i just wanted to let you know that we're safe but we have a disastrous few days here. On Saturday, the sea level just keep getting higher and higher. Eventually, it flooded the railway line. <coughs> By noon, the water had reached our house, and we had to be rescued in boats. We went to shelter, and we spent the night there. However, the water has completely ruined the furniture in our house downstairs the flood has had a terrible impact on the community there are a dozen families whose homes couldn't be saved mark exercise 2 cross out the mistake in each sentence and write the correct words one sentence has two mistakes so be careful with that guys number one for example being an aid worker is a very challenged job so in this case the mistake will be challenged it can be challenged job it's got to be challenging job so number two the work hours are sometimes longer longer is the mistake it will be long the job can be stress and demanding in this case the mistake will be stress it gotta be stressful four you have to be flexibility and creative guys you can't be flexibility you can be flexible five you feel responsible to help people in need this job might be a reward for you guys remember the part that uh, one sentence has two mistakes in this case is this one so the first mistake will be responsible it will be responsibility so for the next mistake the word will be reward the correct word guys for this one will be rewarding with exercise number three is put the words in the correct order to make sentences one the city's infrastructure was completely destroyed two the main roads were blocked three the earthquake struck the city center 4. There was a shortage of gas. 5. Volunteers had the task of rebuilding. 6. They tried to flee the sea. For exercise number 4, guys, is to choose the correct option to complete the sentences. 1. The earthquake led to widespread devastation. 2. The government evacuated the people. 3. It is a serious crisis. 4. The charity appealed to the public for money. 5. 
The drug leads to food shortages. 6. The government agreed to send aid to the area. 7. People started to flee the disaster zones. 8. There was a rise in the number of homeless people after the second earthquake. For exercise 5, guys, match this sentence halves. This one is easy. So, number 1, helicopters dropped food supplies. 2. There were food shortages. 3. They had to first clear the debris. 4. The charity launched a relief effort. 5. It damaged the infrastructure. 6. They asked for help from the international community. So, for exercise 6, circle the option that does not form a collocation. So, number 1, the earthquake fleet struck or devastated the region. It would be fleet. 2. The war led to humanitarian crisis, infrastructure, disaster. Infrastructure, it would be the answer. 3. There were shortages of roads, water, food. It will be roads. 4. Helicopters dropped debris, food, aid. It will be debris. 5. The government launched an appeal, a relief effort, or an aid. It will be an aid. 6. There was a widespread infrastructure destruction or devastation. It will be infrastructure. Okay, for the next exercise, guys, eh, you know completely how this works. So, we have nouns and we have verbs. So, for example, on number one, we have the noun devastation. The verb will be devastate. So, now, for number two, it will be destroy. The noun would be destruction. The noun of appeal would be appeal. That remains the same. The noun of for supplies, so the verb would be supply. Provide, his noun would be oh, provisions. The verb to evacuate will be evacuation. So, to the last exercise, guys, we will have a little crossword and we will start with the downwards so pay a lot of attention one a long period of very dry weather that's called a drought a time when the electricity supply to an area is cut off black out a storm of with strong winds and heavy rain this one will be a hurricane frozen rain would be hail now let's go with the across words. A very large and destructive wave in the ocean. This is pretty obvious, it's a tsunami. 5. A sudden violent movement of the Earth's surface. Earthquake. A period of time when the weather is much hotter than is normal. This would be heat wave. 7. When a large amount of water covers an area that should be dry. Flood. Okay guys, this is everything for this class by my part, so hope to see you soon. Goodbye boys, stay safe. Okay guys, so today we're going to start with the listening. We're going to listen to the first part of a radio program to find out um, two specific things. The first one is what the, what the disaster was and where it happened and when. So pay attention to those details and what the impact of the disaster was, okay? So let's listen to the audio. Uh, if you need to, you can listen to it twice, and then we'll check these questions. The earthquake that struck the small Caribbean country of Haiti on the evening of January 12th, 2010, measured a massive seven on the Richter scale. 
The devastation which it caused was simply staggering, hitting the capital city, Port-au-Prince, particularly hard. Over the next few days, the country, which has long been one of the poorest in the world, struggled to cope in the absence of any organized relief effort. Many of those who had survived were left to fend for themselves. The city's hospitals had all been destroyed. Roads in and out of the city remained blocked, and the seaport, which supplies would normally have been delivered to, was also unusable. A humanitarian crisis was unfolding. Okay, so on page 106 in your student book, the first question is on number six. It says what the disaster was. So the disaster was an, an earthquake, right? Where did it happen? In Haiti, right? And when? What year? In 2010. Good. Now, what was the impact of the disaster? So that it was a widespread devastation, right? It was uh, widely spread among among th that place. Okay, so number seven says working groups and discuss the questions. So have you ever heard about a disaster described in exercise six before? Maybe we as Mexicans, we have heard about this. The last time we heard about a, a disaster like this was uh, September 19th, right? In Mexico City. Do you know anything more about it and how the country is now? Remember that Mexico has has uh, had uh, programs to to help the people. But uh, still, it, it is very difficult. People that lost their homes there are still recovering from that. Uh, the next question, how do you think social media maps and photographs such as the one above could help in this situation? So maybe this is a, 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 a great idea to help people to locate where the biggest uh, area of disaster was and maybe where some people are still where, where some people can still be found right so it is just a matter of all this good guys uh moving on to exercise number eight it says to listen to the second part of the radio program about how patrick Mayer first used an online mapping technology called ushari in haiti in haiti and answer the question so we have three questions how did he get information to update the online maps on Ushahiri, how did the, how did this information help the people affected by the disaster, and how else has Ushahiri helped people elsewhere in the world? Okay, so uh, go ahead and listen to the to the audio, and once you've listened to it, try to answer the questions. You can listen to it twice, and we'll come back to to the answers. Watching all of this thousands of miles away in his Boston home was Patrick Mayer, who decided that he had to do something, anything to help. Mayer, whose girlfriend Christine Martin was doing research in Haiti at the time, came up with the idea of using technology to create an interactive online map that crowdsourced information about what was happening on the ground. Using free mapping technology called Ushahidi, which had been developed a couple of years earlier in Kenya, he started updating a map of the country using social media reports, many of which he soon realized he'd need to get translated. Within a few days, he was having to reach out for volunteers, many of whom had Haitian roots and were only too happy to help. And before long, over 1 million edits had been made to the map. This incredible resource quickly became the main map used by all those involved in helping to provide aid and assistance to the people of Haiti. Using the incredibly specific information it provided, helicopters were able to drop tents and food to desperate people whose homes had been completely destroyed and evacuate people who were trapped or injured. The map was quite literally a lifesaver, and it set a new standard for how technology can be utilized in times of crisis. Since 2010, Ushahidi has been used to focus world attention on humanitarian crises and to help tackle forest fires in Russia and floods in Colombia. And most remarkable of all is the fact that anyone with access to a smartphone, tablet, or laptop can now play their part in all of this as well. We are all connected and all able to help. Okay, so number one, how did he get information to update the online maps? So, uh, 
Of course, he got it from social media, right? That's what he told us. People responded effectively. Number two, how did this information help the people affected by the disaster? So uh, he mentions that the aid was more effectively provided to those in need, right? Because they identified who needed the, the aid the most. Number three, how else has Ushahidi helped people elsewhere in the world? So now this, this program is used globally to tackle humanitarian crisis, forest fires, and floods. Great. Guys, uh, if, if you were able to do so, look at numbers number nine and identify all the, the following. We have Kristen Martin, Kenya, Hayden Roots, One Million Helicopters, World Attention, Russia, and a smartphone. Try to, to identify what was said about each of these uh, mentioned ideas and based on the audio. Okay? Great. So, on exercise number 10, it says Patrick Mayer calls the work he does crisis mapping. In recent years, crisis mappers have started using more technological tools in their work. How, how might these tools be useful to them? Can you think of anything else that might help? So the first one we have is 3D modeling, modeling technology. Then we have drones. We have hashtags, artificial intelligence, GPS, and satellites. Okay, we have an example there. Hashtags might be useful for crisis mappers because they can use social media to see where the most requests for aid are coming from, right? Remember that a hashtag is very popular now. We use them everywhere in social media. So if you use a hashtag, uh, now even with COVID, let's say, um, people can easily identify what you're talking about, right? And it's easier to locate information using a hashtag. Now, what about 3D modeling technology? This can be um, to, to identify and to plan how to reconstruct the city, right? right? Now drones to locate people, to locate affected areas. Artificial intelligence. How can artificial intelligence be used here? Maybe, uh, like we said, like with apps, with phones, um, maybe some, um, in this case, even drones, right? For GPS, well, the GPS helps locate all the areas. So the areas can easily be identified and satellites for the same reason, right? So think about all that, maybe grab some ideas, write some down, and we'll, we'll continue from there. Guys, today we're going to be talking about a grammar, a grammar topic. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about relative pronouns. Relative pronouns is something that you have seen over and over again. And, uh, well, they're basically relative clauses. But in order to talk about relative clauses, first we have to know how to use relative pronouns. The most popular relative pronouns that we have is who, which, whose, whom, and that, right? Remember that who is used for people. For example, the woman who called yesterday wants to buy the house. So we're specifying that that woman wants to do something, right? Now, which is used for things and animals? Did you see the letter which came today? Or I love the puppy which is jumping at the kitchen. We use who's for possessions of people or animals. He's a man whose opinion I respect. So the opinion uh, belongs to the man. She's a student whose handwriting is the best in my class, right? So the handwriting belongs to the student. Now we have whom, which is used for people when the person is the object of the verb, okay? The author whom you criticized in your review has written a letter in reply, okay? Now for that, is used for people, things, and animals. The girl that we met in France has sent us the card. We live in the ground floor flat that backs onto a busy street. Or do you like the cat that is sleeping underneath the table? So that is mostly, uh, it can be used for, for different purposes. As it says, like in the first example sentence, is used for people. In the second one is used for things. And finally, it is used for animals. Now, we have two types of relative clauses. We have defining and non-defining relative clause. 
So what is the difference? If you can see in this chart, we have uh, the differences there clearly stated. So for example, the first one in defining relative clauses, we do not need commas, okay? So the necessary information is essential to distinguish which thing or person we're talking about. So I call my brother who lives in Ontario, okay? And non-defining, we have to use commas, okay? My brother, comma, who lives in Ontario is older, okay? And there, not ne the we need the comma because we have extra information. It is not necessary to distinguish which thing or person we're talking about, okay? Uh, for defining, we can use that. We can use that instead of for which. So that's the mug which that I bought in Paris. Or I didn't know the man who that was there. We cannot use that uh, with non-defining. So we cannot use that instead of for which. These bikes which cost a fortune are made in Japan. Not that cost a fortune, right? So we cannot use which... Um, I mean, we cannot use that with the commas. Now, for defining, relative pronouns can be omitted. We don't need to use them. So we can omit who, which, that when they are followed by a subject plus a verb. So, for example, do you like the song that I wrote, which I wrote? That's the, man, the song I Or you can say, do you like the song I wrote? Or that's the man I like, or that's the man who, or that I like, okay? But in non-defining, we cannot omit who or which. So they introduced me to John, who I liked immediately. Not John, I liked immediately, right? They introduced me to, they introduced me to John, I liked immediately. That's incorrect, okay? So guys, uh, this is pretty much clear. If you need to take some notes, come back to this image because here are the most important differences with defining and non-defining relative clauses. Okay, now coming back to our book on page 106, we have exercise 11 and it says to look at the grammar box and answer the questions. So let's look at all the sentences uh, in, the, in the grammar box. We have the earthquake that struck Haiti measures 7 on the Richter scale. The devastation which it caused was simply staggering. The country, which has long been one of the poorest in the world, struggled to cope. The seaport, which supplies with which supplies would normally have been delivered to, was also unusable, unusable. E. Watching all of this in his Boston home was Patrick Mayer, who decided that he had to do something to help. F. Mayer, whose girlfriend was doing research in Haiti at the time, came up with the idea of using technology to create an interactive online map. G. He had to reach out for volunteers, many of whom had high Haitian roots and were very happy to help. H. Helicopters were able to drop tents and food to desperate people whose homes had been destroyed and evacuated people who were trapped or injured. Okay, so now let's look at exercise number 11 and it says, look at the grammar box and answer the questions. Number one, let's do this together, guys. Now, what are the relative pronouns in each sentence? So let's go to sentence A, which is the relative pronoun there? It is that. Good. Letter B, the devastation which it caused was simply staggering. So what is the relative pronoun there? Which. In letter C, which letter D which this is easy right <laughs> letter E who letter F whose girlfriend right letter G um, whom and letter H we have two in letter H the first one is whose and the next one is who good now, for number two says, when do you think each one is used? So, we use that to qualify nouns that describe people, right? When do we use which? We use which when, when, when we want to qualify nouns that describe things. Now, remember that who and whom qualify nouns that describe people. And then we have whose which qualifies nouns that describe possessions or connections. Number three, 
Defining relative clauses, qualified nouns, and tell us exactly which thing, person, or place is being referred to. So which sentence include, include them? So which sentences include defining relative clauses? So that would be sentence A, right? Because it's not separated by a comma. Letter B, because it's also not separated by a comma. And letter H, because we don't have any commas there. That can be something uh, that we can use as a reference. Number four, what is the difference between the defining relative clauses in the sentence you just identified and the others? So, uh, basically, non-defining relative clauses contain extra information about the nouns, okay? That, that's why they're separated by a comma. Number five, in which sentence can the relative pronoun be left out and why? So, that would be letter B, the devastation it caused was simply staggering. So that which doesn't, uh, we don't need to use it. We can, it means the same thing if we say the devastation which it caused was simply staggering or the devastation it caused was simply staggering. And it means exactly the same thing. Now for number six, it says to look at sentence D. Where does the preposition go in relation to the verb? And how else could you read, how you write this clause? So, we have, look, let's focus on the sentence Z. The seaport, which supplies will normally have been delivered to, was also unusable. So the preposition is to, right? So it goes at the end of the relative clause. And how can we rewrite this sentence meaning the same thing? We can change that to, to um, before the pronoun. We can say the seaport to which supplies would normally have been delivered and that would be like in very formal English. Okay, so that too can be changed and, and be placed before the, the pronoun. Okay, good. Guys, hopefully there are no questions with this. This is something that we have seen over and over again over, over several levels now. It's something quite easy. Okay, now please move on to your student book on page 144. To the grammar reference. So in the grammar reference, um, it says relative clauses. Relative clauses add information after nouns. Different relative pronouns are used depending on the nouns being qualified or in the information that follows. So we have defining and non-defining clauses. Some relative clauses explain exactly what the thing or person is, um, which is that that would be the defining relative clause and some just add extra information that may be of interest. So that is non-defining, okay? Which, with defining, defining relative clauses, we have commas are not used, and the relative pronoun can be left out when, the, when it is the object of the relative clause. For example, the devastation it caused was simply staggering, or we can say the devastation which it caused was simply staggering. Now, with non-defining relative clauses, the clause is separated from the rest of the sentence by commas. So, remember, it's between commas. I'm sorry. Um, that isn't used as a relative pronoun. We cannot use that. And the relative pronoun is never left out. We always have to use it. So, the country, which has long been one of the poorest in the world, descended into chaos. Uh, a relative clause, guys, can start with a preposition plus which or whom. However, this is rather formal English, like I told you, and the preposition is usually placed at the end of the clause. So uh, it is more common to use a the preposition after, at the end of the relative clause, not at the beginning. Okay. So where and when can also be re can also replace a preposition plus which, and like for example, crisis mapping brought. Uh, brought about change in the place in which or where I was born, okay? Great. So, uh, this is something that we have already seen in the past images. Good. So, let's move on to exercise number one on page 145. And it says, complete the sentences with these relative pronouns. So, we have none of whom, which, most of which, which is when, that, who, where and whose. So let's go ahead and do number one together. It says one of the first major events to utilize crisis mapping was the 2010 Haiti earthquake. 
blank killed and injured hundreds of thousands of people. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the earthquake. Which relative pronoun can I use to talk about a thing? That would be which, which killed and injured hundreds of thousand people. Guys, take a couple of minutes to read these sentences and answer them, okay? And we'll check them after. Please pause the video after you finish, play the video again, and we'll check it together. Okay, so let's check. Number two, technology is particularly relevant in places. So we have that keyword places. We need to use where, right? Where official government is limited or no longer fully functions. Number three, more than 40% of the population now receives some form of, form of international aid. So blank is food assistance, most of which is food assistance. Number four, many local people, blank lands have been ruined by illegal mining, are now turning to technology to tackle the problem. So, many local people, the lands belong to them. So, whose lands, right? Number five, the plane crashed in thick fog with 87 people on board. Blank is thought to have survived. So, none of whom, right? None of them survived. Number six, the volunteers, comma, blank, came, come, across, come from all across the region, quite literally put roads, buildings, and highways onto the map. So, who? The volunteers who come from all across the region. Number seven, the amount of data available via social media increased dramatically in October, blank, the flooding reached the capital. October, which is when? We're talking about a period of time. Number eight, Online map mapping blank relies on volunteers with varying skills to interpret satellite images obviously has its limitations. So the, the last one we have is that, right? Online mapping that relies on volunteers. Great. Guys, moving on to exercise number two, it says to rewrite the sentences in a more formal uh, manner with the prepositions at the end of the clauses you have to leave out the relative pronouns where appropriate so for example number one says the town in which we were staying narrowly missed being hit by the hurricane so uh we have the rewritten form the town where we stayed we were staying in so let's look at this the preposition is in right so the town we were staying in narrowly missed being hit by the hurricane okay the town in which we were staying narrowly missed being hit by the hurricane. Let's do number two together. It's an achievement of which we are all very proud. So, that will be... That's kind of easy, right? It's an achievement we are all very proud of. Okay? So, we're using the, the prepositions at the end of the clauses. Okay? At the end of the clauses. Okay, so guys, you're going to do the same for numbers 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Follow the two examples given. Write them down in your notebooks because there is no space on your student book on page 145. And we'll check them after you finish. Great. Number three says, the following day, a second smaller earthquake hit uh, the town from which the aid was being distributed. So, the following day, a second smaller earthquake hit the town where the aid was being distributed from. Okay. So, we use there uh, the relative pronouns. We cannot leave it out. Number four, as we fled the city, we encounter an elderly man with whom my son insisted we share our food. Of course, we need to use with there, right? So, um, we're going to use, as we fled the city, we encounter an elderly man who or that my son insisted we share our food with. Number five, 
The roads of the west of the city, from where many thousands fled, were largely blocked by debris. So, that was me. The roads out of the west of the city, where many thousands fled from, were largely blocked. Number six, the experience varies widely, depending on the charity with, with which we're working. So that would be, the experience varies widely, depending on the charity which we're working with. Number seven, on her arrival, Miss Cuddy, with whose approach I totally agreed, agreed, remember we have to say agree with, right, to control of the situation. So, uh, on her arrival, Miss Cuddy, whose approach I totally agreed with, took control of the situation. Good. And number eight, the book to which you're referring was the very first on the subject to be published. So, the book which you're referring to was the very first on the subject to be published. Excellent. So guys, please go ahead and correct them if you need to and take a couple of minutes to do this. Uh, be careful, remember the prepositions were supposed to be at the end of the clause, of the relative clause, and some in some cases we, do we didn't need to use the uh, relative pronoun. Okay guys, so now let's go to our student book, page 107 on exercise 12. And it says, uh, complete the summary with, the re with a relative pronoun in each blank. Can any of the blanks contain a different word or be left blank? If so, which one? And explain your choices. So we're going to the first one together and then you guys do the rest. Now remember, there's, uh, you can use more than, than one relative pronoun or sometimes it can even be left blank, okay? For example, the year 1945 was an important one for Europe. Some people see it as the year blank the modern world started. So, uh, we're talking about uh, a time, uh, a period of time. So, we can use when. What else can we use? See it as the year that the modern world started or see it the year the modern world started. So, we can use that, when, or blank. All three are correct. So remember, let's go back. Some people see it as the year that the modern world started. Some people see it as the year when the modern world started. Or we can say some people see it as the year the modern world started. And all three options are correct. Okay. So guys, take a couple of minutes to answer the rest. Pause the video. And once you finish, play it again so we can check together. Next one says, let's check now. Europe was in a mess. The kind of mess blank is almost impossible for people today to imagine. So the kind of mess that or which, right? That is almost impossible for people to imagine or which is almost impossible. Now, six years of war had devastated the continent. Tens, tens of millions have died. Millions more have been forced to move from the places they had previously lived. So here we can use the places that they have previously lived, where they have lived, previously lived, or we can say to move from the places they had previously lived. Okay, so it can even be blank as well. And life was unbelievably hard for those blank survive. So we're talking about people for those who had survived or that had survived. The majority of the survivors were women and children Blank husbands and fathers had been had been killed or imprisoned. So we're talking about the, the family members that belong to them. So we have to use whose, right? The next one. Nobody had anything blank they could sell. Nobody had anything that they could sell, which they could sell, or we can say nobody had anything they could sell. And men with weapons wandered the land, taking whatever they wanted. How was the task of rebuilding achieved? Well, most importantly, Harry Truman, Truman, I'm sorry, we're talking about a person, was the President of the United States. So, who was the President of the United States? Put into place systems blank were intended to help all states regarded as allies. So, place systems which or that. 
systems that were intended or systems which were intended. The U.S. Secretary of State, General George Marshall, blank name, so we're talking about his name, it belongs to him, so whose name was given to the plan, announced massive amounts of aid for war-torn countries, much of which was to be used for reconstruction. The Marshall Plan ran for over 10 years and paid for the rebuilding of infrastructure. Blank provided employment and sped up the return of normal life. So, um, the Marshall Plan ran, over, ran for over 10 years and paid for the rebuilding of infrastructure. That or which, right? That or which. Good. So, guys, uh, this is kind of easy. It's just relative clauses, relative uh, defining relative clauses and non-defining, and they're quite easy to identify and to use as well. Okay, maybe the the confusion can be where to use which one or how many can we use, right? But remember that we can use several for certain specific reasons. Good. If you need to, you can go back to the images in which uh, each use is stated. Okay. Guys, let's go on to the last exercise, to so number 14, my perspective, and it says to work in groups and discuss the questions. So I want you to think of questions one and two, write down some notes. Uh, for example, the first one says, have any disasters affected your country in what way? And number two, did there need to be any rebuilding after the disasters? How was this done? Okay, so maybe let's talk about the last earthquake, uh, the 19th of September in which most of Mexico City was was destroyed, was, uh, yeah, destroyed pretty much. And most of people were affected because they didn't have, uh, the, all their belongings were lost. They didn't have any food, any shelter. That was, the, that was how they were affected, right? So did any rebuilding need to be done after the disaster? Yes, right. And pretty much it's still happening. Most most people are do not still have their homes and they're still working on it. Right. Excellent. Take some notes, guys. Maybe you can think about something else and it's totally valid. Good. Great. Hello, students. It's very good to speak with you and I hope you're staying at home. And well, Today we're going to begin working on practice test number five um, on reading part one, the vocabulary review. So uh, let's begin. Get ready. Okay, guys, so the first thing you have to do is match the vocabulary with the pictures that we have here in this slide. We have, repeat after me, bloodstream, depression, medication, coincidence, exposure, wheat, Boost, deficiency, outlook, self-esteem, remedy. So please write the number in the correct uh, blank spaces that we have here for each. All right, guys, in this exercise, you have to fill in each of the sentences with the correct noun. So in the first sentence, we have, it is such a coincidence to see you here. What brings you to the city? So for each of these sentences, please complete each one of the words that we have here. All right, guys, for this exercise, you have to match the vocabulary words with their correct definitions. So for example, number one, we have on top of the world, and this is an expression, a common expression, popular expression. And the definition for this is to be very happy. Okay, so repeat after me, on top of the world, down to, cheerful, prescribe, Treat, stimulate, release, relieve, damp, dreary, temporary. So here, guys, we have a list of the five verbs that we have for this lesson. We have, repeat after me, prescribe, treat, stimulate, release, and relieve. We already saw the meanings, so it should be easy for you to fill in the sentences using different forms of these verbs, okay? They don't have to be the exact same words. They have to be different forms. I'm not going to help you because I would like you to work on this exercise by yourself. Take your time. Okay, guys, so uh, tell me what are five things that are difficult for you to cope with during this quarantine. Remember that to cope with is a phrasal verb that means to manage, to handle, 
to keep under control. So you have to say something and you also have to say why. For example, not being able to exercise in the park. Why? Because it has made me, it, it has, uh, made me gain weight, for example, right? So remember, you have to give the, I mean, say what happened or what has happened to you that you have had to cope with and say the reason. Five different things in your notebooks for next class, guys. Okay, guys, now listen to the song, I'm on top of the world, and please fill in the blanks. You have a series of blank spaces. This is the first part of the song. Here we have the second part of the song, and at the bottom it, it says open this link to listen to the song. So this is a link to the original uh, song. It's by Imagine Dragons. And uh, so it's for you to practice your uh, listening and writing skills. Hi guys. All right, so we're going to begin uh, with uh, reading part one. Please pay attention and follow the reading in your books. What makes us feel good? Why can we, one day, feel on the top of the world and the next feel like everything's just too much for us? The fact is that how we experience different emotions is actually all down to science. Our moods and emotions are influenced by chemicals called hormones, which travel through our bloodstream and send messages to different parts of the body. Our bodies produce hormones which affect us in different ways. Some hormones cause a physical response for example, the hormone adrenaline is responsible for the fight or flight reaction. Hearts beat faster, breathing increases, and our bodies are ready to either face a dangerous situation and fight or run away from it. Other hormones affect our feelings rather than our actions and produce a more emotional response. Hormones such as serotonin and dopamine make us feel cheerful and are important in the treatment of those who suffer from depression anxiety, and other emotional causes. Medical professionals have found that prescribing medication which stimulates the production of serotonin in the body is an effective way to treat these kinds of conditions. It can help people to feel more relaxed, happier, and in some cases, more able, more able to cope with day-to-day -day life. What do we do? Ah, sorry. What we do, eat, and how we live helps release these hormones naturally, but how can we produce enough of them to get the feeling good effect? First, let's have a look at what these hormones are and how they help. Serotonin, known as, as the happiness hormone, is one of the chemicals at work when we feel happy. It relieves depression and reduces anxiety as well as helping us stay emotionally balanced. So what exactly makes us make our serotonin levels go up? Have you ever noticed how people always seem more cheerful on a bright sunny day? Well, it's not just a coincidence. Exposure to sunlight can help release serotonin in the brain and make you feel better than you do on damp, dreary days. Eating more carbohydrates can have a similar effect, but also complex carbo carbohydrates like nuts and wheat increase serotonin. Their influence may only be temporary. For a longer lasting feeling of happiness, combine carbohydrates with healthy fats and a range of protein rich foods like fish, meat and eggs, which contain an acid that is converted into serotonin. Greeting a serotonin boost is, uh, no sorry, getting a serotonin boost is great for the feel good factor, but a lack of this hormone can cause conditions called serotonin deficiency disease. Sufferers have a very low level of serotonin, and this not only affects mood, stress, and anxiety levels, but also sleep patterns. Endorphins are also important hormones. Known to reduce anxiety and how sensitive we are to pain, they are essential for a healthy mind. Exercises, exercises stimulates the production of endorphins, so that's why you normally feel happier when you've been playing sport, uh, for example. In fact, doctors recommend physical activity for mild depression and many people find that it is effective in improving their mood. Uh, if, it, if it is a lack of concentration and the inability to focus that is the problem, then you are probably low in dopamine. Phenylethinamine is another amazing hormone which can make us feel a kind of happiness, similar to being in love. 
Cocoa beans contain this hormone, and this may well explain why chocolate is so popular. Of course, we all know that eating well and getting plenty of exercise is good for a healthy lifestyle, but now we can see how important it is for having a happier and more productive outlook on life. Hi guys. All right, so we're going to begin uh, with uh, reading part one. Please pay attention and follow the reading in your books. What makes us feel good? Why can we, one day, feel on the top of the world and the next feel like everything's just too much for us? The fact is that how we experience different emotions is actually all down to science. Our moods and emotions are influenced by chemicals called hormones, which travel through our bloodstream and send messages to different parts of the body. Our bodies produce hormones which affects us in different ways. Some hormones cause a physical response. For example, the hormone adrenaline is responsible for the fight or flight reaction. Hearts beat faster, breathing increases, and our bodies are ready to either face a dangerous situation and fight or run away from it. Other hormones affect our feelings rather than our actions and produce a more emotional response. Hormones such as serotonin and dopamine make us feel cheerful and are important in the treatment of those who suffer from depression, anxiety, and other emotional problems. Medical professionals have found that prescribing medication which stimulates the production of serotonin in the body is an effective way to treat these kinds of conditions. It can help people to feel more relaxed, happier, and in some cases, more able, more able to cope with day-to-day -day life. What do we do? Ah, sorry. What we do, eat, and how we live helps release these hormones naturally, but how can we produce enough of them to get the feeling good effect? First, let's have a look at what these hormones are and how they help. Serotonin, known as, as the happiness hormone, is one of the chemicals at work when we feel happy. It relieves depression and reduces anxiety as well as helping us stay emotionally balanced. So what exactly makes us make our serotonin levels go up? Have you ever noticed how people always seem more cheerful on a bright sunny day? Well, it's not just a coincidence. Exposure to sunlight can help release serotonin in the brain and make you feel better than you do on damp, dreary days. Eating more carbohydrates can have a similar effect, but also complex carbo carbohydrates like nuts and wheat increase serotonin their influence may only be temporary. For a longer lasting feeling of happiness, combine carbohydrates with healthy fats and a range of protein rich foods like fish, meat and eggs, which contain an acid that is converted into serotonin. Greeting a serotonin boost is, uh, no sorry, getting a serotonin boost is great for the feel good factor, but a lack of this hormone can cause conditions called serotonin deficiency disease. Sufferers have a very low level of serotonin, and this not only affects mood, stress, and anxiety levels, but also sleep patterns. Endorphins are also important hormones. Known to reduce anxiety and how sensitive we are to pain, they are essential for a healthy mind. Exercises, exercise stimulates the production of endorphins, so that's why you normally feel happier when you've been playing sport, uh, for example. In fact, doctors recommend physical activity for mild depression and many people find that it is effective in improving their mood. Uh, if, it, if it is a lack of concentration and the inability to focus that is the problem, then you are probably low in dopamine. Phenylethinamine is another amazing hormone which can make us feel a, a kind of happiness similar to being in love. Cocoa beans contain this hormone, and this may well explain why chocolate is so popular. Of course, we all know that eating well and getting plenty of exercise is good for a healthy lifestyle, but now we can see how important it is for having a happier and more productive outlook on life. For next class, please answer reading part 1 from practice test number 5 on pages 102 and 103. We will check next class. 
Okay, guys, uh, to conclude with today's class, your homework is workbook page 101. There's five exercises that you will have to complete. It's exercise number 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, okay? So make sure you complete them, answer them correctly, take your time, use your time wisely, and complete them, okay? And we'll check them next class. So uh, this is the end of today's class. We really hope you guys uh, understood and everything was clear for all of you. So um, enjoy your week. Goodbye. See you next class.